Welcome tonight to our TMBT radio show, Globe Warriors. Um, tonight we're blessed to have uh, one of the young men from my hometown who I can truly say that I've been knowing since he was a young man. Um, his name is Maurice Carter. So very proud of this young man in ways that um, I can't hardly explain. Uh, talked to his parents and uh, been knowing his dream for a long time. And so I'm really blessed to have with us uh, during Black History Month. Uh, one of the young legends, as I call him, uh, who has um, become quite a young man who always puts family, God, and basketball first. And so we want to say thank you to Maurice Carter for being here. Thank you for having me. Good, man. Good. We really appreciate you. Uh, we got a lot of time. I want you to talk about. Uh, we're going to get into how you started, uh, where you are now today as a father, um, as a man of God, and just want you to just talk about your life and how blessed your life has been and how you have been able to fulfill all of your dreams and uh, everything that you thought about doing as a young man uh, to all of our middle school listeners that you were able to make those things come true with pro basketball. So we want you to talk a little bit about that. Uh, first, I want to give all the thanks to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, without him, uh, I don't think any of this, I'm sure none of this would have been possible. Um, I try and thank him before I play, before I sleep. Uh, before I do anything, but um, I started out as just a normal kid, just like everybody else around here. I grew up watching guys like yourself, uh, Corey Alexander, and guys like that. You know, set an example for me to be, um, you know, like you say, humble, and then also working hard in my craft. I got up every day, man. I was I was hungry. Um, you guys inspired me to 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 want to work and and to play, and then also want to be great at this thing. So. I think today kids kids have to realize that it's a jo it's a job, and the way you approach it, uh, you have to work work up every day and work, and then um, also want to work at it. And um, you know, I started out you know playing uh, at Virginia Randolph. Uh, I played there as a kid, church socks and, and church, <laughs> church clothes on. Man, I would go out to church and play. And then um, from there, I went to middle school at Brooklyn Middle School, where I started playing football and basketball. And then from there. Um, it kind of took off. Uh, I was a freshman at Highland Springs, but one of the greatest players that I've ever seen played Jonathan Hargett. Uh, I think, you know, looking back at that, we kind of made history. And then, um, you know, just so so much made of that as a kid. Um, I look back at it now on how great we really were and how great he really was. Um, you know, from Highland Springs, I transferred to DeMatha Catholic High School in Maryland where we were a number one high school team in the country. And I think things kind of changed for me there because coming from a small city like Richmond um, and then going to Maryland, D.C. area, the basketball ball was just so much different up there than it was here. Uh, they took it much more serious. There was a lot more players. And then that was num another uh, humbling experience for me, not being, you know, per se the guy there my first couple of years. I had to learn how to, how to play with other good players and then also how to uh, be a true point guard. And I think that's where the maturation of my game came, not just being a scorer, but also being a guy who can run a team and get other guys involved. Um, and then also seeing other great players in, in their own right and meeting guys. So, And then I graduated from Eleanor Roosevelt High School in Greenbelt, Maryland, where I played with guys like Delonte West, who was a first-round draft pick in the NBA, a really good player, a guy named Eddie Bads, and then played at UNC Charlotte. He was a draft pick for the Chicago Bulls. Um, so, you know, just for me, it was a blessing to be able to pl play with great players. Uh, that was part of my journey and being successful, playing with good guys, guys who shared the same dream as me. And, um, you know, after playing in high school with those guys, I went to Robert Morris University in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's a mid-major on uh, Division One. I. I always had the dream of playing at a high level. But when I got there, I also realized no matter where you play, if you can play, uh, people will see you, people will see find you. you. And, um when I got there, man, I just, you know, I was focused on, you know, accomplishing my dream, my goal of being a pro. Um, we, I had a really good college career, thank God. I went through ups and downs. I think that's what a lot of kids today don't understand. It's not going to always be a success story. You're going to hit a, a patch sometime where you're not as successful as you want to be. Um, think things aren't going your way. But it's not about what happens to you. It's how you respond to them. Um, a lot of kids go through adversity. A lot of people and they just give up. Um, for me, um, I went there as a freshman. I played right away, but I didn't have the kind of year that I would have liked to have. Uh, it made me hungrier 
to work harder. And then in the summer, I worked hard, got back. Um, and then my sophomore year, I kind of took off. And then from there, um, I entered the NBA draft. I didn't get drafted. It was it was another time in my life where I was really upset. I felt like I should have got drafted, and I didn't. Um, and then I played in the CBA, the NBA D League. I did a bunch of minor leagues before I went to um, my first job overseas in Dominican Republic. That's where I met my beautiful wife, Annabelle. Um, she was playing there as well, which is a huge part of my story and my drive now. I didn't even know I met my wife, but um, basketball took me not only to play and earn money for my family, but I met my soulmate, the mother of my child. And, um, you know, from there, I, it kind of took off again. Uh, that season, I got player of the year in South America. I think I remember Milt, you telling me a story where you were playing your, your last year professionally. And you saw me playing in DR. It was actually my first year, so it shows you the turn the, the turnover from you know me playing as a kid, watching you being one of the greatest players to play around here, to you finishing your career and me starting mine. Right, right. And um, you know I'm really thankful for that, and uh, I'm appreciative of it. And then from there, you know I played in various countries: Dominican Republic, Venezuela, Mexico, Puerto Rico. I played in Benghazi. Played in Macedonia, Turkey, France, um, and this season and came home in November from France. Um, that's my latest job. But you know, basketball is taking me all over the world, not just from a playing standpoint. But you know, you're in the gym two or three hours a day, and then the rest of the time you're there, you're living and experiencing, you know, other cultures, other people's, you know, life, which is a huge wake-up call for me. Um, you hear the saying today. You know, basketball ain't for everybody, and that's true. Um, it's not kids on video. You're not just playing basketball. You're experiencing life right. in other countries and um, in different places. So for me, um, it just made me be more thankful and grateful of what we have here. You know, my family, and then a support system. All those things go a long way uh, when you when you're trying to accomplish a dream of being a professional basketball player. Yeah, they do, bro. And you hit it right on the head. Um, I've been. Let's see. Well. Wow. I'm telling my age, I'm 47, so the first time I came to see you guys play, you probably were about 15 or 16, maybe, at Highland Springs High School for the great George Lancaster, and uh, he brought us in to scrimmage you guys, I think, as some older guys, and <laughs> we came in, and so the two guys that uh, they told us to worry about were, I think, you and Jonathan. Hey, if you can stop those two young guys, and so here we are as older guys trying to chase you guys around, and so... Um, I think you get more respect. I have, um, of course, come to respect you more as a basketball player. But when you have a chance to uh, meet now as an old guy, um, sometimes I play with you at 6 a.m. Uh, with those guys out at Carmax. <clears throat> and I get a chance to see you really work. And so it's a thing of beauty to see a true point guard. Uh, even though you're younger than us, you still have that. Um, I heard you mention Corey Alexander. You have that old school game to you where you, you're smart. You're going to do what's best for the team. But yet and still, you still look to get the bucket, which is the thing that I'm sure you can attest to that has uh, gotten you these calls. And, and, and had you go back to these countries for several several seasons is because you're able to put the ball in the bucket. Uh, what do you attribute that to? What's your, uh, what's your magic? Because you get, I guess as a point guard, you need your point guard to get or to be the first option of scoring. So what's your mentality when you have the ball or... Um, has it changed over your high school, college, and pro <clears throat> career? Uh, talk a little bit about that. I've been blessed to have great coaches. It um, started out, as you mentioned, Coach Lancaster. And he was a guy who, if you couldn't score, you couldn't play there. <laughs> and uh, that's just the bottom line. And so for Jonathan and myself, uh, I think that's something he, he saw in both of us, it, is the ability to score at, at an early age. Um, and it helped me a lot, but it also hurt me. And so... Like I mentioned before, I was a guy at Highland Springs, of course. When I went to, everyone knows the matter and the whole program there. When you go there, it's 12 of you. Right. It's not just you individually or another guy. So I had to learn how to play with other players of, of my caliber. And, um, but, you know, I, I developed that at an early age. That was something I always worked on. I never lost it. But, um, you know, he kind of instilled, instilled that in me at an early age, and I never lost it. So, um you know, when things get tough now, of course, like you said, t teams don't want guys who are limited. And so for me, I'm 34 now. I'm getting to be 
an old man. <laughs> uh, these teams are taking younger guys, but they're also interested in guys who can score the ball. So for me, everywhere I go, I've always been a volume scorer. Um, and so it's allowed me to continue to play at a high level. So something I, you know, it's like riding a bike. You can't lose it. But um, and I think a lot of guys today, the game has changed a lot. The younger players are extremely athletic, um, but they uh, they overlook the ability to, to be able to put the ball in the basket. And I think that's something we have to get back to, you know, here in Richmond especially, but all over the country. Right. Right. You see the guys in Europe who have the high skill level of being able to score and play. You see guys like Dirk and those guys come over and they just hit the ground running. So. I feel like it's something that we have to continue to teach here, but also continue to pay attention to as well. Right. It's big what you said because for me, of course, being older than uh, you guys, I, of course, see the game has changed since I played and since I was a young man. But for someone who I consider to be a young man, said that the game has also changed. It just lets you know that uh, basketball is evolving, the evolution of life, the evolution of, of the game of basketball. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, like you said, Guys get jobs who can put the ball in the basket. So it's pretty simple, pretty cut and dry. Um, talk a little bit about your family, um, if you will. Um, of course, I said I met your mom probably before you started playing. Um, I was actually at a funeral that we attended, uh, and your mom was there. And your mom was just, she kind of reminded me of my mom. She wanted some info on how to help her son play pro basketball. And so... She didn't tell me who it was that she was talking about. She was just talking about her son. And so once she said <laughs> who you were, I said, yes, ma'am. I, I probably just played basketball with you maybe uh, maybe a couple of weeks before. And so uh, she just went on. And so I knew, of course, at that point, I don't even think you had started, but I knew that when you have a positive influence as parents, it really helps uh, your, your progression as a ball player. I don't know if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. But when you know you got your parents back, and so you can kind of concentrate on basketball. Um, um, it really helps, whether it be monetary, energy-wise, or what have you. It really helps when you know that you have your parents back and that they support what you're doing. Um, talk a little bit about your family. Well, for me, man, that's, I'm a huge family guy. And uh, my mom and dad have meant everything to me. I hear a lot of, you know, new term guys saying I'm self-made. <laughs> Exactly. That's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. Um, and some guys may feel that way, you know, to each his own. But for me, if I didn't have a support system, mom and dad, right. in my ear every day, uh, supporting me. Being, I used to get made fun of all the time in Holland Springs back in the day. My mom would come in with the video recorder with the orange cord, and she would record every game. Mm -hmm. And again, I was a freshman on the varsity, so I was a kid playing with, you know, young men. Right. And they would laugh at me and joke. But from that, I mean, since I've been a kid, man, I can remember my mom has been in every game, every tried to, every event. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was, you know, he didn't have any education. Um, he actually didn't even finish middle school. But he found a way to become an entrepreneur, you know, in a couple of barbershops. He supported us in any way he could to make sure we was all right. And I learned, I kind of learned, the, the, you know, just the meaning of hard work from him. He'd get up every day. And, uh, you know, in America, if you don't have education, you can't. Suppose you can't work, you can't earn money, but for, to see him him do it, knowing that he didn't have the education, um, it led me to believe I, I could do anything. Right. And so it was on me, man. And I look at a lot of guys that I went to high school with who aren't doing as well. Um, I thank my dad, you know, a couple of years back, I got a, a contract that was a decent amount of money. I said, Dad, I thank you for raising me the way you did. Because he was on me, man. Uh, he, parents, parents were real old school. And so they don't believe in no talking back. They don't believe none of that stuff. So mm -hmm. I thank them, every, you know, every chance I can get for being my my support group and then, you know, just instilling those values in me. And um, it led me to have my own family now. I have a two-year-old daughter named Mila, which is the biggest blessing, the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and also I, um, my beautiful wife, she's been, she played basketball at a high level as well, so she kind of gets it. And I feel like I'm, you know, I'm the luckiest guy in the world because most guys don't have that other half who played and understand the grind. Right. And that's exactly what it is. When you're waiting for a job or you're training, playing at 6 o'clock every morning, I'm waking her up sometimes, turning the lights on in the house, and she's sleeping, and she has to, you know, get the baby up and go to work. She understands. She gets it. And she's still telling me to this day, you know, 
play as long as you can. You know, when you're done, go out on your own terms. And I couldn't have asked, you know, God for anything better than that. And I don't take any of it for granted. Um, I just hope that I can continue to play at a high level and transition to be a father and, and, and husband the way I'm supposed to be. The good thing is, if I remember correctly, we were talking the other day, and you actually have your Dominican passport, which for those listeners that don't understand, to have a another nationality is like having gold in your hands <laughs> because you can essentially, uh, just to uh, break it down, we'll let him talk about it a little more, but... You can occupy the space of a foreign player, right? Yep. So if you're playing in Dominican Republic, uh, <clears throat> he can occupy the space of a Dominican player, which allows that team to still contract two players. Talk a little bit about that and explain to those people that may not know uh, what that's about. Explain to them a little bit. So, you know, for a lot of guys, and myself included, I was ignorant to the fact that, you know, teams and countries were doing this. My first in Dominican Republic, I was on the smallest market team. We took the league by storm. We <coughs> were undefeated for the whole season. We ended up winning the championship. I luckily got MVP of the league. I played some of my best basketball. And um, the next season I came back, it was a huge deal. Nobody had ever seen me play. You know, It was during the NBA lockout at the time, so NBA guys were coming over. And I was embarrassing them. And they like, you know, who, who in the hell is this, is this kid doing this? And... Um, I would hear it a lot. And so the next season, I'm thinking to myself, you know, things will never change here. I'll always have a job. I'll always be welcome. I kind of took it for granted. And we lost our first two games. And the general manager came to me and said, listen, you know, we're paying you X amount of money. We're not winning. We got to We're going to have to cut you. I said, man, I was 26 years old, maybe. I'm like, I didn't know which way to turn. And uh, so my wife, you know, we had been dating for a while. And uh, she actually mentioned it. She said, you know, if, you know, because we talked about getting married and we, you know, we've been dating on and off. And um, she said, um, if we get married, you know that they can't change you. They can't cut you. Right. And I'm like, huh? Right. And she said, well, she played the Dominican Republic national team. She was a starting point guard for the women's team there. She's a really good player. And I'm like, you know, what you mean? So we started talking about it. And we'd already talked about, about being married and wanting to be with each other. So. I got we got married in 2013, and the the day <laughs> we get married, I contacted the agent I was working with. Mm -hmm. I said Annabelle and I got married, and no less than maybe 20 minutes later, a team they sent me a message on Facebook. Yeah. Social media is huge now. Hey, we hear you married. We want to naturalize you. I'm like, what does that mean? So we started talking about. They said you can play as a Dominican player, and lo and behold, we got married. The team paid for the whole process of me getting citizenship, right. started me being able to play there as a native player. And um, so I went there and I played. They, you know, I ended up getting a Dominican passport. We went through the government. We did most of the work ourselves. And, um, you know, I actually played in Puerto Rico as a Latin player as well. So it allowed me, you know, to earn money in different places, um, to know how it feels to be a native player and not an import player, which makes, makes it way more comfortable for you to play. <laughs> um, and it also it guarantees your contract. So in that situation where she, we talked about it, if I'm not playing well, hey, you can't cut me. I got, <laughs> I can stay here. And you better pay me. There's nothing you can do about it. So it was a huge relief point, and then something I just didn't. A lot of guys don't know about. Um, one of my good friends, he actually plays. He played for FC Barcelona. He's playing in China now. He has another passport, which is, I think it's a Montenegrin passport. So. A lot of guys are doing it now. If you if you're good enough, a team will pay for it, and um, you know it's it's becoming a huge thing. So I'm happy I got on it when I was younger. But it also allows you to do business things in the country. You can open your own business without paying taxes. A lot of stuff we have talked about, um, not just to so basketball opens up, up you know a lot of other doors than than just you know on the court. So I'm happy I did it, and uh, that's that. It's the I'm trying to think what's the equivalent for people who maybe can't understand. It's the equivalent, of course, uh, it's a way to guarantee your contract, which unless you have a no-cut clause in your contract, uh, it's the safest way to go because you essentially can't be cut, but the other two Americans that you play in what can be cut, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the law also protects you guys 
or the guys that have their passport, um, you guys actually have rights where the, let's say, the Dominican lawyer or whoever can pick that case up and maybe win it for you. If you are a American player trying to do that, you can cancel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. not going to happen. Mm -hmm. happen. So it gives you more security because that contract is guaranteed, which essentially is what all pro basketball players uh, play, want, for, yeah. play for. Play yeah. um, for is what you play for. Uh, talk to me a little bit more about God. Um, I wrote down three things about you. When I think about you, I think family, God, basketball, or God, family, basketball. Uh, talk to me a little bit about your relationship and and. Um, with God and how <clears throat> for our younger listeners to talk about how important it is to know your dreams and then know what you're asking God for. Um, talk a little bit about your relationship with God uh, as well. And so a lot of guys, Steph Curry has made it, he's made it huge today. Every time he scores, he, you know, hit his chest, point up to the sky. And he talks about his faith as well. Tim Tebow was another guy who did it. Um, for me, man, like I said, my parents were extremely old school. So Sunday morning, I talked about it briefly before, I used to get made fun of because I would show up to my little league game Sunday with church socks on. And I would have my, you know, T-shirt on. And my, sometime in the summer, I had the, the, the dress shorts on. I was a fat kid. <laughs> and so people would laugh at me because my mom would tell me Sundays, if you don't go to church, you don't play in this game. Right. And I'm like, well then I got to go to church because I wanted to play. <laughs> and so they instilled that in me as a young kid, man. It's like the same thing as being a good ball handler, a good shooter. It's the values you get instilled and the skill that you're being taught. Um, for me, man, when you get older, you realize how important the God, God is. Um, and I know for me personally, without him, I wouldn't have experienced any of these things. I wouldn't be able to play. Should I wouldn't be able to walk. And so... Um, I just, you know, for me, mom and dad were always on me about it. Um, I try, you know, I pray before every game. A lot of times we're doing a national anthem in other countries. I'm praying. I'm just thanking God and asking him to, to lead me in the right direction. And just like anything worth having, you know, it's tough. Sometimes you go astray. You, you don't remember all the things that you're supposed to do. You get off track. It's like basketball. You know, you don't play good helps ID. You don't make the right pass. The same thing being a Christian or whatever your religion is, uh, you get off track sometimes. But for me, I know that, you know, he's the reason. He's the reason for my daughter being here. Um, I see her every day and I realize, you know, nothing else is more important than what God's gift is. And that's my child. And um, I thank my wife every day for giving me that gift and then also allowing me, me to be, you know, Mila's father. So I just see it in so many different ways, man. It's, I think a lot of people don't want to identify or talk about it today because it's such a touchy subject, but I know every time you get out on the court, man, anything can go wrong. And I'm not saying Porzingis or any other guy who got injured is not a faithful guy, but um, things like that can happen all the time. But, you know, I feel like God protects me every time I step out on the court and play, every time I walk out the door. And so just, you know, playing in different countries, man, and seeing guys, my first year in DR, man, <coughs> I tell you I was player of the year, so you're on TV there, and people know you by by face. I walked out of my hotel, and uh, one of the security guards was across the street with an AK-47. And in America, you don't see that. He's like, hey, Mar he said in Spanish, hey, Maurice, come here. I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to walk down this <laughs> other way. I just didn't feel kind of, but it showed me that, A, in America, you know, we live in a bubble. But also, you know, as being a Christian, I'm like, man, I just thank God for protecting me, because anything can go wrong. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's the part um, I heard you say it earlier, and uh, I talk to it all the time <clears throat> with my kids and my students. I think we as Americans, we are uh, spoiled, mm -hmm. and I think for me, I'm sure for yourself as well, it gives you a different view when you're able to go outside of your own country and live and work and raise a family. And when you come back to your own country, it makes you more appreciative. It makes you more humble. It makes you thankful for what we have here because, like you said, you've been to some places. Um, I heard you name some places that were scary. Mm -hmm. uh, not scary as, uh, like, dangerous, but some places where scary as you ask, like, where my son is from in Venezuela. Like, how are these people eating? And so you have teams that are paying huge sums of money 
uh, and people that live two blocks away can't feed themselves. So it's something that I'm sure has to touch your heart, especially because you are an international player, an international father. And so how does that uh, just touch a little bit about uh, some things that you've seen that has uh, maybe changed your life, maybe made you a better father, better husband, a better son, some things that you've seen along your journey that uh, make you thankful to be where you are. Okay, so my it's a story I always tell. My first year playing, this was my first year overseas, and all this stuff kind of happened, you know, extremely fast. My cat, you know, they assign you a driver. The person driving drive you around my driver, he got deported from New York back to the Dominican Republic. And so he spoke fluent English, luckily. Um, but he was a cab driver. And so he told me, he said, man, the team told me, don't take you into the city to drive you from practice to the arena back to your, to the hotel. And so one day he said, man, it's burning up too much gas. Can I take you to my house and change my car and then take you to the hotel? I said, sure. And so I get to his house. And it was like getting smacked in the face with a hammer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This guy was living on dirt floors. Mm -hmm. uh, he had no running water. His wife was pregnant. And um, so I'm sitting there all trying to process all this stuff at the same time. I'm like, he had no shower. I'm like, and after, after all this stuff, you know, my wife was pregnant and stuff. She was a word to have. I'm like, she couldn't even bathe. And so she had a huge blue trash can. And she had a hose. And she that's how she... You know, she bathed every day. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was sitting there. I didn't want to sit down because I didn't know. His, his, his house was extremely small. And so I'm leaning on a, on a shelf in his house. He said, man, I don't lean on that. I was like, you know, kind of like, why? He's like, man, I took some spit and I just, it's held up by spit pretty much. I don't mm -hmm. even have the right. little thing, necessities we take for granted, glue, hot water, uh, whatever it may be. Right. And then for me, I said, man, you know, basketball for me, this is the life lessons you learn. You know, my mom would always tell me, don't throw your food away. You know, eat all your food, be grateful. And then it started to hit me like, man, this is why mom and dad saying this as a kid. And um, I think for us, kids in the States, we're extremely spoiled mm -hmm. and privileged. And we don't we don't mm -hmm. appreciate what we have. And so it, sometimes it goes on deaf ears until you actually experience it for yourself because it did. I was the same way. But, um, you know, a lot of kids say, man, I'm from the hood. I'm from the trap. Until you go and see how these people are really living over there who actually have to kill and do, you know, things that you shouldn't do to feed their family. Right. You know, then you understand what that what those statements really mean. So, you know, I'm great, grateful for those, you know, those lessons, man. But I'm also grateful for the fact that I'm able to process them and learn from them and then apply it to my family as well. It's big, man. You talk about uh, my own son. I think you and I have had this conversation. My own son is from... <clears throat> a country where they don't have basic necessities that I don't think people here would really, they would freak out if uh, they had to go through stuff in countries where I've been or where you've been or where my own son is from. We're talking about normal, everyday items, toilet paper, mm -hmm. cooking oil, mm -hmm. milk, things that we probably take for granted. <coughs> uh, some people are actually doing without. So it gives you a greater appreciation for, first of all, I think it gives you a greater appreciation for what your parents have done for you. Uh, and then it gives you a greater appreciation for what you actually have at that moment. And some guys, it doesn't hit, some guys don't stay long enough where it hits them. But for yourself and some other guys that I know that, um, I know a couple of guys that have actually had the passport situation that you have and have played until they were 51 years old. Sure. So, uh, hey, like I said, I'm, I'm no pressure, but um, man, that thing is like liquid gold in your hands, man. So uh, really proud of you for taking advantage of that because it's offered. Every player has that same option. It's only the guys who are smart enough to take advantage of it. And not to say that a guy is not smart if he doesn't, but if you got to know, you got to know your profession inside and out. And so with knowing that, you know that the way to maximize this opportunity is to have dual citizenship and it's something that the United States offers it's legal uh, and so for those guys that don't know those uh, young guys we have that are listening that uh, we're helping to get overseas do your research uh, wanted to ask you while we're here I want to get you to shout out all of your social media people always say that um, I don't ask my guests enough for their social media so how can people contact you for those uh, international players that want to follow in your footsteps 
how can they reach out to you to ask, hey, uh, how can I get started? Or how do I get started? So we want, uh, we want you to shoot out your social media for the people that are listening. My Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram is the same. Mo Carter 13. Uh, my Facebook is Maurice Carter. It's real simple. <clears throat> Pretty simple. And then, of course, as always, any questions that um, you guys have, you guys can reach Maurice on his uh, social media, or you can uh, email us at uh, on our website, which is www.miltonbellbasketball.com, and we can pass the message on to Maurice in case you guys do want to get in contact with him, have questions. He's a pretty uh, open, open and good guy, so he will answer any questions that he can. Try to help, however he can. Uh, but it's it, it's a thing where I'm sure you get that all the time. Uh, young guys ask you, "Hey, man, how do I do this?" Because um, if you know, then you know. But for those guys that um, I try to help as well, they have no clue. Some guys want to play uh, international basketball but don't have a passport. And so what's the first step? What's your first step, your number one thing when you advise guys? What are you advising to do first? Well, the first thing you got to be is realistic with yourself. I think a lot of guys today, um, they, you know, they want to play at that level and they want to be successful, but you got to be realistic <coughs> Um, if you if you putting and you know if you're putting the work in and you, you're able to play at that level, then be aggressive about attacking your dream and your goal. But secondly, you gotta get a passport. You can't leave the country with a you're an American citizen, it's your right to have a passport. So go put you know, it's an investment you make. Instead of going and paying two hundred dollars for some shoes, a lot of guys like to go to the club, take that two hundred dollars out, hundred and fifty dollars, go get your passport and paperwork done and, and then you can start the process. It sounds funny, but um, I actually talk to guys every day. You would think, and I get it. Um, I guess I was <clears throat> um, naive to the fact of what it took, but I talk to guys every day that don't have their passport, and so that's something that um, we try to help guys with. So for those guys that need help with the passport situation, you can contact us uh, on our website. We can help you with the passport situation, with the expedition, or trying to get it done, whatever you need, uh, and we'll be able to to help with that. Uh, tell us a little bit about, um, I heard you mention your daughter. You have a young young daughter. I think Mila is her name. I see you all the time writing it down. And you, uh, The fatherhood part. Tell me about your daughter. I mean, it's so much I, I, I want to say. Um, Mila changed my life the day she was born. And, I, and it sounds cliche and cheesy, but for me, um, you know, she was, she's the best thing that I've ever done in my life. Um, and it's so weird how Mila and basketball all coincide. So I was in the finals in Dominican Republic, game six, I believe. We had four days apart. My wife was pregnant and she called me. She said, hey, they're going to induce my labor. I said, whoa. Oh. And so my team, a lot of teams won't be open to you, actually letting you go home for it. But my wife, she played there. She's Dominican. And, um... They said, hey, listen, we're going to, you can go home for a couple of days. You got to be back for, for, you know, for game six or game, whatever it was. So I get to, to New York, Annabelle called and she said, hey, they gave me the wrong induction date. And I'm like, what? And so, you know, I get to Richmond, man. She's upset. We're all upset. Um, so I actually had to fly back, play in the finals, and I saw Mila born on FaceTime. Mm, okay. And it was, you know, for me, man, it's something that I will always remember because of that. But, um, you know, it goes to show you the business aspect of basketball. And then also, uh, that's my firstborn child. So, right. Right. Um, but for her, man, I'm just, I'm blessed, man. I'm happy. I thank God for every night, every morning. She's such a blessing. Whatever I'm going through, A, she don't care. And then <laughs> B, it, it doesn't matter because I'm always going to be her father. Right. She's always going to be my daughter. And, then, you know, it's, it's, it, it makes you realize there's so much more in life than just basketball. You know, as a pro, you, you fo- focus and lock in so much on your craft and working out and lifting weights and being in shape. So, sometimes you forget about things in life. <clears throat> um, but for her, she reminds me every day. And the older she gets, it becomes even better, man. Now she's starting to realize and know who I actually am. Right. right and so right. to sit there and spend time with her all day is like one of the most amazing things I've done. Um, so I just want to be a better person, better father, better Christian for her. Mm-hmm. But it also, you know, these last couple of years, you're playing for much more than yourself. Now you're playing for 
her well being right. for her to have and for her to be okay. So right. I love her more than anything. Is you know life itself, man. So that's pretty much sums it up. That's the beauty of <clears throat> parenthood, of parenting, and being a parent is that the closest thing I I try to explain to people is that when you're a single guy and you're about to cross the street and you say, "Hey, man, I can run across this street, mm-hmm. man. I can get over here easily. I know I can. I'm quick." fast, I'm young, I can get across. But when you have kids, you say, hey, I'm going to wait until this light turns red Mm -hmm. and walk across the street like a normal person because you know you have people that are dependent on you. Mm -hmm. So fatherhood changes you. It makes you uh, kind of enjoy life more but be more careful knowing that you have people depending on you. And like you said, for yourself, uh, married, family, it kind of uh, makes you focus a little more. Um, I'm sure you, as a uh, married professional, international superstar, it helps you to know that, hey, uh, all of this noise, as LeBron James calls it, all of this noise that's going on around me is just noise, and my real world is at home. Mm-hmm. So regardless of what happens, media, travel, boom, uh, you kind of have that that buffer of the family being your uh, like safe haven, you know? So so that's a beautiful part about it is uh, being a guy that travels and have your family and priorities in order like yourself. It really helps maintain focus. You don't spend aimless uh, money uh, doing crazy things that single guys do. You have your money focused on your family, which uh, is hard. I'm sure it took you. Um, I'm sure you weren't. Uh, you were a young, single, uh, traveling uh, superstar, and so it's things you learn. Um, I see you laughing, but it's funny. No, it's true. I, I, was, I was thinking of another story, man. It was, so it was so weird. We recently, three years ago, four years ago, we bought our first home. And before Mila was born, we were living downtown. Um, yeah, in the loft, it was it was the perfect spot to go out and hang out. And two things happened. One, when she was pregnant, something hit me, clicked. I said, man, Mila can't be born and live down here. <laughs> but secondly, playing basketball, it it allowed me to have financial means to go out and purchase a home. Um, and you and I don't take that for granted. One day, a lot of people they want to do it, but you know, so being a basketball, it allowed me to do that, and I'm thankful for that as well. But um, you just your mindset changes, man. Immediately, I was a young, young single guy, and I look back and, and think of just you know monetarily some of the things I would do before I was married with a wife and kid. And so you just, the older you get, it's like your game. Your game matures. You become a much smarter, um, alert basketball player. But it's like that in life. You become more mature and more alert about, you know, money and then and different things. So, you know, when, when Mila was born, Annabelle got pregnant, it allowed me to be a better person, a better father. So, that's the beauty of it. And I'm sure as you have figured out that using basketball as a means of taking care of your family is a great, for guys like us uh, that we've been playing basketball, guys that we know that live it and, and breathe it every day, when you can wake up and go to practice twice a day and then you come back and you're in a foreign country. Uh, that's what you dream about. You don't know how it's going to happen. You just know you want to play pro basketball. And so uh, for a young man who has accomplished so much at a very young age, um, it just shows you and and to those uh, young guys aspiring that are listening, uh, hard work. uh, What does Floyd Mayweather say? Hard work and dedication. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. You can say that you um, you were definitely dedicated to your craft. Uh, can't, uh, Can't wrap up without asking you about being that we're here we only have 28 days in Black History Month, uh, being that you are one of our uh, African-American young legends that I call here in the city that inspire young guys to be like yourself. Uh, tell me what Black History Month uh, means to you. Uh, we recently had Martin Luther King's birthday. Uh, uh, so talk about uh, being an African-American, international superstar, family man. Uh, sum it all up and put it in the Black History uh, Bowl for me. Well, for me, um, and again, a lot of people say it, but do you actually mean it? Black History Month for me is every month. I feel like for one month, for us to be narrowed down to one month, it's a slap in the face. But speaking on it, um, 
embracing the fact of being an African American, the struggles that we went through. Um, I think a lot of kids, you get mistreated so much. It's like anything. You're like, man, I don't want to have nothing to do with it. But I think for all of our young people, you need to embrace the fact that you are an African American. Um, but also embrace the fact of treating one another the way you're supposed to be treated. You know, the Bible and all that stuff, it, co it goes hand in hand. It's like treating your brother the way you would treat, you would want to treat anybody to treat yourself. Um, I think a lot of kids today trying to be successful and get ahead, we mistreat each other in the process. Um, but, you know, being black, man, in, in America, man, it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge deal. Um, because every day, you know, we're being attacked in various ways. But, you know, also being educated will be, be the biggest thing I say to people, not just, in, you know, through books, but educating yourself, educating your mind and then your body as well. So um, for me, being black, man, it's one of the most important things in my life. I'm proud of it. Um, and I'm happy to say that I'm African-American. That's big. Uh, it is huge that a young man of such a young age understands <clears throat> uh, what's going on in uh, in society, in the world, uh, because I can honestly say that at your age, I didn't realize, of course, everything that I've realized now at 47, I didn't realize at 34. It's part of, part of the growth of the man, part of the growth of the African-American man, and so um, it's one thing that I try to teach my kids to be more educated about uh, Black History Month uh, than I was at that age because, uh, of course, now you have technology and social media and all the stuff that makes it available, all of the Martin Luther King speeches and everything that people have access to. So I highly recommend people go out and, and especially the young kids to use, to take advantage of the technology, take advantage of all the social media. They can actually find out who he is better than we can tell you because, mm -hmm. uh, um, that's the beauty of technology, of, of being in 2018. The technology is, is so fantastic that you can do all of your research, all of your uh, homework, and just find out who these people are. They really put us in positions. Uh, somebody made it possible for you and I to be able to go overseas and play pro basketball. So I was going to say that. Also, just being appreciative of people who pay you that way. Because I think, that, again, we take for granted for being able to do what we do today. Um, but the privileges that we have also, um, and there was somebody who took that whack upside the head, right. who took that, you know, wife or, or mom being raped, whatever it may be, for us to be able to sit here comfortably and do what we do today and also earn money to play, to play basketball. It's a blessing. Uh, it's a blessing. And so it's a blessing for uh, um, your parents to, of course, be able to raise you to know that the uh, right from wrong, first of all, but to make you, uh, to raise you as a kid that's focused on whatever your task is, uh, whether it be school. Um, I always remember you being a good student as well as a good basketball player. So just focusing on the things that are necessary. You had to uh, pay your dues in, in high school and then in college, and then when you get to play pro basketball now, it's time for you to use that to take care of your family. And so uh, just to see your progression and evolution as a young man. I just want to say very proud of you, brother. Thank you, man. Very proud of you and, and your family. And, of course, he's here with his wife. Uh, she's here. We thank her for coming and allowing him to be a part uh, of our show. Uh, he's one of my special guys. Not only is he uh, an international legend, but he's one of my special guys. I've been knowing him a long time. So for me and, and, and some of the other older guys, I'm, I'm sure they feel like I do, it's kind of... Uh, I don't know how to say it, but good people, uh, good things happen to good people. So he's a good young man, family man, God fearing, and the good things will continue to happen. For all of your Latino fans, um, I always have people, uh, and I should have asked you. I know you speak some Spanish. Is there anything you want to say to your? Uh, hopefully, we'll uh, get down to Dominican Republic. Anything you want to say in Spanish? Uh, we may have some people from Argentina who may be listening. Uh, gracias por todo. Gracias por tu ayuda y por tu support también. Apoyo. Eso es. Pero, y yo cambié al equipo en, en República Dominicana eh, de semana del pasado con soles de San, Santo Domingo. Entonces vamos a ganar. Ok. okay. Uh, 
for those of you that didn't understand what he was saying, he was talking uh, in Spanish. Of course, his wife is from, um, is from Dominican Republic, so they have friends down there. He was talking to the fans from his former team, uh, just, of course, saying that he loved them and, and would be checking in soon. So, uh, once again, before we let you go, I want you to scream out your social media handles, all your stuff, so people can contact you one more time. Social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat is M O Carter thirteen, um, and then my Facebook is Maurice Carter. Okay, well you guys heard it from, uh, as I call him, I know he's tired of it. He um, he blushes when I says it, mm-hmm. say it, but I call him a young legend. Not only for basketball, but in order for me to call you a lump, a young legend, you have to be a legend in your community and what you do for kids and how you carry yourself. So when you guys hear me call people and players that it's not just because they score and, and, and rebound and dunk. No, it's how you carry yourself and carry yourself as a professional and and, and how you go about your your energy and, and all of that. So it, it's more than just uh, basketball for me and how we feel about this young man. So I uh, want to say thank you uh, again, Maurice, to you and your wife for coming and uh, talking a little bit. We hope to have you back that maybe uh, – uh, have you talk some more to uh, young guys who are trying to be like you and trying to travel to some of these places. Maybe you can come back and shine some more light no uh, into what it takes to to keep this thing going. And so for those guys that are listening, uh, just want to say keep going, maintain focus, and uh, uh, any questions you guys have, he's put his social media out to you guys. So uh, use it. Take advantage of it. And uh, let's get in contact with him. So we're going to sign off now. Uh, Globe Warriors, TNBT Radio with Maurice Carter. We'll talk to you guys soon.